Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Why All Process Plants Are Over Design, being, de being uh, presented by Tom Kendall. My name is Aidan Montague. I also work for Mintrex and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. So just before we start, a few housekeeping, housekeeping items. First of all, the main presentation will last 25, 35 minutes and then we'll have, say, approximately 10 minutes of Q&A. Uh, so depending on questions, the webinar will last in total about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask Tom questions during the webinar, uh, and those you can enter in the question pane, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, but we will answer all questions, or Tom will answer all questions at the end of the webinar. So please feel free to enter your questions as we go along. Um, so first of all, in order to get started, I'd just like to introduce Tom. Uh, Tom's got a wealth of experience in the mining industry, uh, consulting engineer with 45 years experience in mining and heavy industry. He's an experienced design engineer and has been engaged in the entire project development process. Of course, he also has enormous experience in feasibility studies and scoping through to bankable studies. So now I'd like to hand over to Tom and I hope you all enjoy the webinar. Over to you, Tom. Okay, Tom, I can see your screen. And thanks for, thanks for that introduction. Welcome listeners to this uh, first Mintrex webinar, which will address the issue, why all, uh, why all processing plants are over-designed. We, we're going to discuss why all plants are over-designed, what that means, and what you can do about it. We've titled this presentation with an epithet that's often directed at design engineers. To highlight why the accusations are often made, we provide a picture of a glaring example and then provide some history about that and uh, why the over-design occurred, including the constraints, the trade-offs, and uh, by understanding uh, the drivers of over-design, then perhaps we can minimise it. Uh, the way the role of the engineer is understood in a project has a part to play in whether and to what extent over-design will occur. Uh, the design process is discussed and the iterative nature of that process um, the nature of uh, minimum performance requirement as a design outcome makes some uh, over design inevitable and we discuss that. Uh, the preconception bias each of us brings to our work can be uh, an inhibitor to over design. Um, we'll discuss zero based design and how that can contribute to reducing the extent of over design. And finally, we'll look at design costs as a proportion of overall project costs. And then we'll have a discussion. When you look into the middle of this photo, you can see trestle legs. All you can see is trestle legs. Following a very preliminary uh, concept discussions and a scoping level estimate, this project was completed and commissioned within 13 weeks of it being approved. The equipment was all second hand except for a new screen and, and the structural support steel. The trestle legs are made from heavy tubing and the design was rationalised to four sizes of tubes uh, in order to um, speed steel procurement and fabrication. In the, uh, in the middle of the picture, the two conveyors feeding the screen and, and returning from the screen uh, had small trusses six metres long. Um, they were second hand and uh, there was no design data available. So although we suspected that they would span 12 metres, um, we uh, ended up uh, providing trestle legs at six metres so that we could uh, place the concrete in the time available. As a result, 
the installation is festooned with trestles and it looks ridiculous. The over design is a result of limited vendor data, uh, second hand trusses with no, no information, uh, limited design resources to create the vendor data, uh, plant layout finalisation and procurement of major equipment being the priority design activity and therefore the prioritisation of uh, design resources. Uh, limited time to complete the design, we needed to have the concrete materials ordered at week three for being on site in week seven and placement uh, by week nine. And uh, finally, the cost of the additional steel trestle legs was estimated at less than $50,000 and that was identified as significantly less cost than um, uh, the production constraint being, um, uh, being realised uh, without a crushing plant, which was about 5,000 tonnes a week of, of uh, additional material the moment the crusher was, uh, was commissioned. So you can summarise those uh, constraints as uh, economic constraints, uh, if you like, the, uh, the prioritisation time constraints, um, we didn't have time to optimise the design, knowledge constraints, which was a lack of data, and resource constraints, uh, people to do the work. There's not much argument that the role of the engineer is to provide the end user with a safe and reliable product. Uh, that's pretty much a given, and to provide less is not acceptable. The differentiator is to save money for the client. An engineer should do for a dollar what a boiler maker does for 10. And if it's the other way around, then uh, the boiler maker is providing a better solution. Engineering's iterative. Each choice uh, you make along the design process adds constraints and possibilities and uh, many times you have to circle back as a result of either the constraints or the possibilities. Uh, engineering costs money and uh, to continue engineering when the uh, potential savings uh, are uh, be becoming uh, very low uh, is, uh, is not an economic exercise. Unless you're working for government or supplying retail customers, your client's in business and you want them to stay in business. If they stay in business, they can give you more work and they can pay you for this job and the next job. A business person expects each employee to provide them with a return. As a young engineer, when I started working for Western Mining, I was told that if I didn't save the company three times my annual salary, I wasn't worth employing. Uh, that was good advice then, and it remains good advice today. The glaring example slide earlier identified the key issues driving over design as economic priorities, time constraints, knowledge constraints, and resource constraints. Prototype designs include all of those constraints, and in mining, most designs incorporate an element of prototyping. Textbooks inform us that prototyping is a high-risk activity. For that reason, it should be minimised, and that's why most engineers start with an existing design and modify it only to the extent required in order to achieve the required design performance outcome. The hand-drawn chart on the slide shows pretty clearly why over design occurs. It's okay to be above the line and it's not okay to be below the line. That means designs below the line are rejected or should be and designs above the line will be chosen. And how much above the line uh, the design lands uh, will be uh, dependent on the individual designer and their motivations. Uncertainty will play a role 
and the designer's inherent risk aversion will play a role. A wise designer will allow for some margin of error. Uh, and a good example of margin of error is the headroom under a crane. Um, my personal bias is to have an additional one metre of headroom uh, to that calculated by the uh, draftsman and, um, and invariably uh, as the design matures through the design process, we end up with something less than three quarters of a metre because some of the headroom uh, has been uh, eaten up by changes in specifications that occur in the normal course of design. If you don't allow sufficient um, margin there, it, quite often you get to the end of the design and you discover you and, and the design's ready to go out the door of course and you discover that you haven't got enough headroom under the crane and and then nobody wants to change the design so you end up designing a a, a lifting beam uh, because the you know there's not enough length to fit the slings in or the or the um, the chains or whatever it happens to be so they are, because of the iterative nature of design, you need to start off with some margin and you ideally still end up with some margin because in the construction process, um, uh, small, small tolerances can be eaten up as well. This famous quote, uh, speaks to the issue of uncertainty. It applies to structural engineering, but there are, the, you know, there are equivalent uh, uh, issues in all forms of engineering. It, in structural engineering, the um, consideration of uncertainty is very sophisticated and it's categorised into three uh, different types of uncertainty. The material properties, the geometry of the of the uh, structures and the forces and loads on the structures. Uh, that categorisation allows uh, structural engineers to better understand and communicate their knowledge shortcomings and to apply different factors for different materials, for different geometry and for different loads. Uh, most people understand that, uh, that soils uh, are uh, very heterogeneous and uh, have a much broader range of material properties than steel, which is very homogeneous. And the structural engineering design factors obviously account for that. Similarly, <coughs> slender columns have different design factors than short, short columns, and that's accounted for by the Euler factor or the Euler equations and nature's loads of wind, snow, flood and earthquake are treated differently to dead loads, which are again treated differently to live loads. David Cornwall wrote under the pen name of John the Square, and he was famous for his detailed research to achieve realistic backstories for his books. He did field research interviewing people to understand how they interacted with one another and what motivated them. And he understood that can't be done sitting at a desk on the other side of the world where you cannot see, let alone hear or feel the emotions and the tools of the trade. It's worth remembering that engineering is an applied science. If you can't use it, touch it or feel it, then it's science, not engineering. In engineering, it's a really good idea to talk to the people at the coalface where you can achieve a better understanding of what they're telling you. Certainly better than you'll achieve over a telephone. It's hard for all of us to escape our life experiences and they are valuable indicators of future problems to be avoided. But there's a difference between life experiences in the real world and life experiences on paper or in books. Experience on paper is often 
informed by hearsay and there's a reason that courts don't admit hearsay. The operational information circulating in a design office is rarely based on personal observed experience. It is usually communicated from an end user to the design team and by the time it reaches a design engineer or the design drafter, it may have been through several retellings. Hearsay information may have limited application from one job to the next job, yet because our personal belief systems are informed by a combination of hearsay and personal experience, over time we're often unable to differentiate uh, between what we did ourselves or saw ourselves and what someone else told us. And it becomes necessary to question our personal design assumptions in the real world and to recalibrate those assumptions. The most extreme example I've witnessed over the years was a conflict between two structural engineers. One designed all the pedestals in his half of the plant, or the crushing plant, as round pedestals, while the other engineer designed conventional square pedestals. At the, as part of the design process, I got each engineer to check the work of the other engineer and check their calculations. Um, a, a, quite a, a vigorous argument ensued and um, the engineer designing around pedestals, uh, which is an unconventional approach, uh, stated that they were much more economical and they'd proved it on the previous job he'd worked on. Uh, the, the arguments went round and round and it wasn't going anywhere and, and, and eventually um, I'd uh, been through the process of selecting the, uh, the preferred concrete contractor so we took the argument to him and he had no hesitation in stating preference for square pedestals and, and, and in particular he didn't have any round forms, uh, he only had square or rectangular forms. The, um, the previous job referred to by the engineer who designed the round, uh, the round pedestals had had thousands of pedestals. It was a very, very big job. And they had uh, uh, rationalised the design to a limited number of round pedestals. And it was economic for the contractor to um, uh, manufacture those round those round forms um, and reuse them through that job. But that was uh, unusual and the engineer had, had failed to recognise that it was unusual and he, um, and he was um, uh, well he was totally convinced in fact that you know there was uh, no better way of doing it than around pedestals and he wouldn't listen to any alternative view. Um, how, did we, how did we resolve the issue? Well, um, it, it was quite interesting because being the crushing plant, we actually did away with the pedestals altogether and, um, and, and probably highlights the fact that not only did the personal views um, uh, blind, blind that particular engineer to the fact that uh, his unconventional approach was an optimum, but it, uh, it, it really led to him overlooking the, the question of do I need pedestals at all? In his famous book, uh, Techniques of Value Analysis and Engineering, Lawrence Miles includes an excerpt from uh, Samuel Foss's poem, The Path of the Calf. The, uh, the poem describes succinctly the manner in which habit robs us of our efficiencies or potential efficiencies. The value analysis is a means of systematically determining the value of a product or service. It looks at the, uh, the value as determined by the performance and cost of the product. Um, and that's, uh, that's described by its basic functions. So the value of a product or service is the sum of the minimum cost of each of its basic functions. 
the value analysis uh, then proceeds through a problem solving system involving uh, four distinctly different types of thinking, information and uh, assumption searching, analysis, uh, creative thinking and judgment thinking. And the challenge is to remove what Miles refers to as stoppers and roadblocks. And these occur as a result of lack of information, wrong information and wrong beliefs. In short, value engineering seeks uh, an optimum solution by first identifying what the solution is and then seeking to implement it. Uh, the concept of zero-based design borrows from the zero-based budget, ZBB, concept that was introduced in Texas Instruments uh, Inc. in uh, 1969. Uh, ZBB was originally developed to overcome the problem of incrementalism that is a feature of non-manufacturing overhead costs in large organisations, both private and government. Typically, such activities are hard to measure, so budgets are developed based upon prior expenditure and uh, escalated. Now, most of us are, are familiar with that uh, simply from paying our annual rates. Um, most councils uh, increase rates by CPI every year, and uh, it's very unusual for them not to do that. The ZBB process identifies budget centres, organisational centres or programs, and through a process of goal setting, uh, develops a budget that represents the most cost effective way of achieving those goals. The whole budget, including in some cases a need for any budget at all, is questioned and not just the increment from last year. We all wish our councils could do that. Zero-based design is design that vigorously questions every assumption. Everybody in a design team comes to the table with their own baggage. Usually they put it on the table and start to spread it through the project. That means the project ends up with outcomes that weren't ever envisaged. The core philosophy for zero-based design is that every design element must be justified by a tangible or an intangible outcome that's required in the in the design scope. Design assumptions need to be related back to the design outcomes and the outcomes need to be evaluated from a cost and risk, risk management perspective. An example of answering a question that nobody ever bothered to, you know, need an answer to is, is how do you design a Bowie knife that is safe for handling by a three-year-old? There's lots of potential solutions such as a Bowie knife in a childproof scabbard. But the most sensible solution and the most cost effective remains keeping the three-year-olds away from Bowie knives. Too often, the solution to a problem is sought without questioning the need for a solution at all. Zero-based design seeks to ensure that the design is only addressed to the client requirements. Zero-based design is a simple process that may be applied by people with no value engineering experience whatsoever. Any engineer or drafter can ask the question, is the outcome of this design effort essential to the project requirements? They may not know the answer, but someone should. And if the answer is in the form of a motherhood statement rather than a specific need to be met, then the question probably should be asked again. More usually, of course, engineers and drafters are imposing their own requirements upon the project and the challenge is to get them to recognise that their preconceived ideas are not necessarily appropriate to the particular project at hand. That is, to recognise the car paths in their own minds. In summary, zero-based design is, a, is seeking to achieve a value engineering outcome by applying zero-based concepts from the outset of the project rather than allowing a project to accumulate design outcomes, then subjecting the design outcomes to a value engineering step to refine the design. This is a very oversimplified look at design costs compared to project life costs. 
but it highlights that the risks associated with a failure to allocate sufficient design resources are likely to be much more, much greater than the over allocation of design resources. Failed project outcomes are remarkably common. In this state, we've had um, Ravensthorpe Nipple, Nickel, Bean Up Mineral Sands, the HBI plant, the Anaconda Nickel plant, um, Cause and, um, and uh, Bulong Nickel plants. There have been many, and in many in, in many of those failed projects, design failures were an integral part of the failure of the project. This morning we've discussed over design and what that means and what you can do about it. We've established in this brief presentation that some under, over design is inevitable, and that's why all, all plants are over designed. We've established that over design is relative, that it costs time and money to optimise design to achieve a most economical project outcome. Sometimes more over design will be most economical. As you reduce time, resources, knowledge and questioning, you will increase over design. If you copy without careful reference back to the design needs, you are likely to increase over design. To reduce over design, you should recognise that design is on the critical path of all projects and make a pro appropriate allowance of time to prepare the design. Plan the design early to allow assembly of an appropriate design resource, men, materials, all those sorts of things. And then apply zero-based design principles and question design assumptions to achieve the required design outcomes only. And it's back to you, Aidan. Okay, thank you, Tom, for that. And thanks to everyone for uh, uh, spending the time. And also thank you for your questions. We have a few questions here, but if anyone else has got questions, please uh, add them to the pane on the, on the right-hand side. Great opportunity to benefit from some of uh, Tom's wisdom. But the first question is from Christopher. And it's a two-part question, Tom. Um, first, the first part is uh, it relates to over to zero-based design. Does does zero-based design automatically mean that the design is more expensive? And if so, how do you help the client justify that additional expense? Um, I don't think it automatically makes it more expensive. I, it, I think it um, it's a state of mind. Um, it's actually making the. Uh, oh, sorry, I haven't shared my web. Is that better? Um, yeah. I don't think the. Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily more expensive. I, I think the. Uh, it, it's important to establish the the questioning. It, as part of your project processes, and um, and and having peer review outside the project um, outside the project group or from outside the project group, so maybe at thirty percent design, sixty percent design, and at ninety percent design, you'll introduce uh, people sometimes from outside the organisation but always from outside the design group to question um, the, the design and the need for the particular design elements. And of course, a core part is to make sure that you've got a clear statement of what the design outcome requirements are at the beginning of the process. Thanks, Tom. 
Uh, next question is from Assad, and it relates to value engineering. And the question is, um, value engineering and zero-based design, is this an either or, or do you apply both? Well, <clears throat> I guess my view is that, um, and, and it's just what I see, is that value engineering is typically a process where a, a, a particular design outcome has, has been um, reached and then there's a value engineering process to review that design outcome. And, um, and, and although that may not be what um, Miles originally intended, that's certainly the way that we see it most of the time. Um, with zero-based design, providing the, uh, the process is followed diligently, uh, you shouldn't need to undertake a value engineering process because you've been doing it all the way through. So it, it, it's not either or. Um, it, it's really, um, and, and it's not a competition either. It, it's really about getting the, um, uh, the design team in the right state of mind so that when you get to the end of the uh, design process, you've got something that answers your needs. Thank, thanks, Tom. Uh, any other questions? Those are the only two that we've got on the pane, on the right-hand pane there. Any other questions you'd like to add whilst we've got Tom here in, the, in his natural habitat? No other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for sparing the time. Hope you enjoyed the webinar and thank you, Tom. And we will now close the webinar. Thank you all very much. Thank you.